Everybody, we're not, we want to go ahead and get started. So please, let's uh, grab uh, what you have for uh, food and let's sit down. It's just a real honor to have Paul Sternberg here with us. Uh, he is really one of the luminaries in ophthalmology, a dear friend, uh, amazing leader. He's had his impact on just so many areas of our field. Uh, he's also uh, has a very long, close relationship uh, with uh, Emmy Hartnett that goes way back. And so I thought it would be only uh, appropriate to have Emmy give a few details, but not too many and too long, because we want to hear from Paul. <laughs> Paul, thank you for making the trek to be here with us. Thank you, Randy. Uh, it's a great honor for me to have the opportunity to introduce Paul Sternberg, who has been a mentor and a friend of mine for many years. Besides being the GW Hale Professor and Chair at Vanderbilt, he's also the Associate Dean of Clinical Affairs and the Chief Medical Officer and Assistant Vice Chancellor for Adult Health Affairs. Paul received his BA from Harvard College and his MD from University of Chicago, where he also did an internal medicine internship. He did his residency at Wilmer Eye Institute and Johns Hopkins and Retina Fellowship at Duke University. He's been president of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, vice president of ARVO, and he's also been president of Macula Society. His research interests have been long standing in antioxidants and age related macular degeneration, and now in regenerative medicine as it pertains to the RPE. He's really been a tremendous leader, a, a dear friend, and a great mentor for me and to many others. And so it's with my great pleasure that I introduce Paul Sternberg. Thank you. Well, thank you, Randy and Emmy. It, it is a real privilege to be here. This is an amazing uh, eye institution. Uh, your chairman, uh, Dr. Olson, has been one of my role models, and when I became you know, I know, you know, we're, all, we're about the same age, but he's been chair for about twice as long as I have. So, uh, and, and when I became a chair, uh, you know, truly, uh, I tried to emulate what we did at Vanderbilt with what has been accomplished here uh, in terms of, of uh, building an institution that, that truly valued all three uh, priorities of our, of, our, of our mission, providing clinical care, extending it to the community, uh, making trainees feel like they were important, not just people to do refractions, uh, and, and having uh, research be ingrained in the culture of the institution, where whether you're a clinician or an educator, you still think about research as being a priority, where the clinicians who know that part of their job is to generate some margin to support the academic missions, and that's not viewed as a crutch, but viewed as, as, a, as a privilege. And you've done that here. Uh, the culture here is remarkable. And, uh, and you can feel it when you walk in the, in the doors and talk to everyone, which I had the privilege of doing yesterday. So I, I want to congratulate you and let you know that, um, that this place really has incredible esteem across the nation and around the world. And um, <clears throat> when we look at the US news rankings, um, we we know that they do not reflect uh, the true quality of, of, of certain institutions around the country. And uh, so don't buy the journal. Uh, <laughs> so um, this morning, I, I'm going to give a talk that I, that I first prepared about six months ago when I was asked to uh, give a, a lecture at the Retina Society. Uh, and they, they wanted me to reflect on, on my career as, as a, a vision researcher. And I'll be honest, you know, I closed my lab about 10 years ago when I became chief medical officer, that I just didn't have the, the bandwidth to, to be a clinician, uh, to be a scientist, and to do all the administrative responsibilities for the Vanderbilt Medical Group, which is a 2,000 doctor practice, similar to your faculty practice here in Salt Lake. Um, but, uh, like Randy, who also doesn't have a lab, it doesn't mean that we aren't interested in science and that we don't uh, read about it and talk about it and um, try very hard to partner with our faculty uh, to push them uh, to identify and solve the key problems that continue to face us 
uh, in our profession. And I think those of us who have been it for a while can look back and remark on the incredible advances that we've made. I mean, I was telling the residents that, you know, there's very little I do in my clinical practice that I learned in my fellowship because of all the advances that have come along. But there still are incredible gaps in, in where we need to go and where we can go. And I think that's what drives us to have chosen to be in an academic institution and to practice here. So the, the area that's gotten the most interest for me is regenerative vision. And uh, because there still are so many patients that for whom we can't do enough to help them see. So we're going to talk a little bit about, about why this has become a priority for me and what challenges it creates, where we stand in our current clinical care for, for patients with these problems, what sort of approaches I think we should consider, and, and then just a few reflections on, on what things might look like down the road. So despite all of our advances, there still is an incredible amount of irre irreversible vision loss. Um, whether it's nationally or worldwide, there are millions of patients that are blind. Uh, glaucoma, macular degeneration, and diabetic retinopathy are the three leading causes of irreversible vision loss in this country. Ocular trauma is another where we still have oh, half a million patients lose some level of sight from trauma uh, each year. The tissues affected are, are neural tissue. The neural tissue of the macula uh, in macular degeneration, the RPE and photoreceptor neurons, and glaucoma, uh, the retinal ganglion cells, and the axons in the optic nerve, diabetic retinopathy, uh, both the outer and inner retina, and in trauma, it's, it's the whole eye that can be affected. And the limiting factors for irreversible vision loss is that, that we're really talking about the brain. Um, the brain is an extension of the eye. That was a joke. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ophthalmic perspective of, of the neural central nervous system. Uh, and the uh, central nervous system, as we know, does not naturally regenerate. So the problems that we're seeing in glaucoma and tra ocular trauma are really similar to why we see irreversible damage from stroke or spinal cord injury and, uh, and, and epilepsy and Parkinson's. In fact, uh, one of the things that really drove my interest in this was that I, we have a pediatric ophthalmologist who, uh, shortly after I joined the faculty, uh, one evening developed a spontaneous uh, spinal cord infarction and uh, became paraplegic just suddenly. And, um, and she has really uh, been interested in uh, regenerative neuroscience as a result. And being an ophthalmologist, um, she has pushed me to make this something that we focus on at our institution. And in fact, she, she is part of our external review panel for the work we're doing. One of the conditions that, that I see most in my practice, and in fact has been an interest of mine, as <laughs> Emmy reflected in her introduction, literally since I was a resident in the 1980s, has been dry macular degeneration. A number of you in the room who, who do retina research, you know, I, I see Paul and, and, and Greg, who have been by my side for many of these years, um, will remember that, that it was hard enough to get any funding for macular degeneration research in the 80s. It was just considered a non, it was a disease that wasn't worth investment because there was nothing we could do. But particularly for dry AMD, there was very little interest in study. And so the, the, the few of us that, that have been beating our heads against this wall uh, have been persistent, and, um, but we still have a, a long way to go. Current treatments, well, if you call it a treatment, uh, are the AREDS supplements. The age-related eye disease study was designed in the late 1980s. Um, I was one of the people that sat in a conference room uh, at the National Eye Institute in, I think it was 1988, when we were designing a natural history study for cataracts and macular degeneration. The age-related eye disease study was designed as a natural history study not an interventional study. While we were doing this, uh, a retina specialist in New Orleans named David Newsom published a very small uh, paper 
with less than 100 patients, followed for uh, six months who were treated with zinc and showed remarkable improvement in their visual acuity with a six-month treatment. The uh, AARP and everyone else went crazy about the import that, that, that uh, this wonderful new advance had been developed and everyone was taking zinc and we decided that we would put a treatment arm in the age-related eye disease study to do uh, a national uh, a, a properly powered study to disprove the benefit of zinc in the treatment of age-related macular degeneration. At the same time, we thought we should look at some other antioxidants, and uh, the dosages that we picked were not too dissimilar to putting your finger in your mouth, wetting it, holding it up in the air, and deciding what the dosages should be. Um, it, was pure, it was the closest thing to guesswork that I've ever done. Uh, we did the study. Uh, it was about eight years later, 10 years later, that, that we had the results. Um, we sat in a conference room bigger than this because there were about 100 centers. Uh, we were asked to put on a sheet of paper whether we thought it was effective or not. They collected the cards. They read the results. 80% said they thought it was ineffective. And then they shared the results that it showed a benefit. So this, is not, this was not a clinical trial uh, like anti-VEGF where we knew within a few months of the study that there was a benefit from the treatment. This was one where not only did we not think there was a benefit from the treatment, we thought there was no benefit from the treatment. So the fact that we were able to demonstrate the statistical benefit uh, uh, of a 25% reduction in progression to advanced AMD was uh, important and has been our only treatment now for 40 years, 30 years, Paul? 30 years? AREDS 2. Similar trial. Uh, the most amazing thing about AREDS 2 was that the data from AREDS 1 was replicated almost exactly. Uh, because there were a lot of people who questioned the statistics of AREDS 1. AREDS 2 affirmed it. So there are things on, you know, people that are working on this. You know, you should know that this good looking guy uh, is, is, has been at the forefront of, of our study of, of, of dry AMD. Uh, understanding the role of, of xanthophyll carotenoids, omega-3 fatty acids, and, and, and both in terms of non-invasive methods to, to measure it, and, but also using those uh, to help uh, combine genetics with uh, uh, interventions to advance it. Uh, and then this other, even better looking guy, um, is, is always has been uh, instrumental in identifying the role of, of uh, different uh, complement-related proteins activators proteins in Drusen, and, and then looking at genetics related to that and uh, trying to leverage those discoveries to uh, develop some innovative strategies uh, to prevent or slow the progression of macular degeneration, uh, combining it with genotypes. Am I accurately reflecting that word? And then this is another uh, uh, familiar face to you. Uh, uh, Sabina Furman, who uh, we were successful in stealing away from Randy a few <laughs> years ago. And I did that because I wanted to move her a little more into translational research and be part of this regenerative vision initiative for us. And uh, <coughs> she is um, trying to see if there are ways that we can uh, re-stimulate dying RPE cells uh, to, by genetic manipulation, uh, to uh, repopulate the areas where they're dying for atrophic uh, using some important signal transduction pathways uh, as, as a mechanism to increase uh, regeneration of dying RPE cells. Glaucoma is, is, is the other big uh, uh, neurodegenerative disease and good work has shown that it truly is a neurodegenerative disease. It's not a disease just of the eye. The retinal ganglion cells uh, are challenged through uh, IOP-related stress. They're uh, biochemical, biomechanical, and bioenergetic mechanisms by which we can hypothesize the, the damage uh, to the ganglion cells and the axons uh, and, and lead to uh, loss of function from glaucoma. And Lowering intraocular pressure uh, is probably a little bit more effective than the AREDS vitamins in the treatment of glaucoma, 
but it doesn't work for all patients. And I think we all know that, that uh, visual field loss can, will proceed in, in a significant subgroup of patients. And we also know that compliance with this treatment is certainly not ideal. And although we search for better pressure-lowering drops and we search for more effective ways to deliver those drugs that are uh, easier for are the elderly patients afflicted with it, glaucoma still remains a significant cause of irreversible vision loss in our population. A gene therapy is something that, that we're starting to think about as, as a, a potential way to treat all of these conditions. <clears throat> um, and you're familiar with the work with the adeno-associated virus, uh, which uh, can be used uh, to replace the uh, damaged uh, genetic material with, with a therapeutic gene. Uh, and uh, the you know, proof of principle has been the wonderful work being done uh, with uh, Labor's congenital amaurosis, the gene therapy for mutations in RPE65, <coughs> uh, the development of a, a drug uh, subretinally delivered, uh, Luxterna, uh, that now has got an FDA approval, the first FDA approved gene therapy for any genetic disease, uh, not just an ophthalmic genetic disease. And I was fortunate to be uh, in, in Lisbon when this group of investigators from around the world were honored. And one of the lovely things about the uh, Champollion Award is that they, they also uh, honored the basic science work that was done, uh, not, not just those people that did the more glitzy uh, gene therapy work. But uh, unfortunately, uh, this is, doesn't work for everyone, and the improvement is, is not permanent. Uh, unfortunately, um, the, a lot of these patients, uh, although they see improvement in their visual function after the gene therapy from the subretinal injection, will start to see some deterioration in that function over time. Uh, but this is really remarkable, and I, and, I, and I think that it provides an opportunity for us to see to have a window into the potential benefits of gene therapy for so many of these diseases. And it's not limited to gene therapy for photoreceptor diseases, uh, but uh, there's work being done uh, for uh, glaucoma uh, that uh, Tonya Rex, who's uh, another member of our regenerative vision team, uh, is using AA-associated delivery of modified erythropoietin, has been able to show that it slows optic nerve degeneration in an experimental model. Uh, uh, of glaucoma. It's a <coughs> microbead model that, that was developed. Uh, the microbeads are injected in the anterior chamber. They block the outflow pathways. And if you uh, give these patients uh, the AAV EPO vector, uh, their vision loss is, is reduced. <clears throat> There's also later labors hereditary optic neuropathy. And there are two ongoing clinical trials uh, using an AAV-mediated gene delivery of the uh, subunit uh, of complex one that can be administered with simply intravitreal injection. And there have been several reports of both safety and efficacy uh, for these patients. Uh, we've been treating a number of them. Uh, we're one of the clinical centers. These are kids that are getting intravitreal injections, so we have to take them to the operating room to do this. Uh, but you can see uh, in, in this image here the improvement in visual fields uh, that these patients experience, um, and, and this is held up to 36 months. So some remarkable uh, benefit uh, from this treatment, and we anticipate that this will probably be the next ophthalmic gene therapy uh, treatment that will receive FDA approval. It's going to take a little while longer uh, to get before that happens, but we anticipate that. But despite these advances, you know, these are you know, the, the ones that are clinically beneficial are ones that have, have very specific uh, gene changes that can be treated. I think we all know that the conditions like macular degeneration, or I was talking with Dr. Bernstein about MACTEL, these are not simple genetic conditions, they're very complicated. And so you know, the 40 foot questions are, you know, how do we prevent diseases of the CNS? Because that's what these become. 
And when we can't prevent them, how do we replace lost tissue? And, and that's the field of regenerative medicine. And the approaches, we feel, vary with the stage of, of, of the disease. So if you can identify it early, you can have protective <coughs> mechanisms. Identify the vulnerable tissue uh, bef before there's loss of function, and I think that's what uh, Greg Hageman is, is trying to do in some of his work. Uh, the repair of the stressed or damaged neural tissue to regain function, that's what, what Sabina is, is the area that she's working on. And then the restoring lost tissue or nerve tissue to regain connectivity with the brain. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I, I feel that, that uh, the work there, which is a lot of it stem cell therapy or, or these uh, artificial vision, um, I guess my bias is that we need to work more on the first two that, that that's really where our opportunities are. So in, in optic nerve degeneration or optic neuropathy, glaucoma being an optic neuropathy, um, you know, we can, you know, how and when do we intervene? So there's a point in the disease where the axons are still intact, so we want to protect those axons from stress. There's a point where they develop early axonopathy, where there are functional deficits that are associated with remodeling, with the astrocyte reorganization, and this is where we really need to focus on repair. When we get to this point where there's really loss of tissue and glial scarring, you know, the, the cows left the barn, and our efforts there are going to be much more complicated. One project that has been very promising has been gene therapy using mTOR, you know, which is uh, we know about from work with uh, autophagy uh, and uh, a very important pathway. And there's been work that has been done by Huberman and his associates that have shown that increasing uh, the activity of ganglion cells through boosting mTOR activity through AAV gene therapy can facilitate the repair of degenerating axons in the optic nerve. And mTOR is really the key to helping those neural tissues remodel uh, after injury. And um, this work has shown that when animals are treated uh, with this, that they can demonstrate re innervation into the central brain, that they also, using sophisticated testing, have improvement in their contrast sensitivity. Uh, it, it's not ideal, it, it's, it's a proof of principle, but it, it shows that there is the potential. Uh, if you identify the right pathway, upregulating that pathway can potentially uh, improve the ability to repair damaged axons and ganglion cells and improve visual performance. Uh, Dave Calkins uh, at our institution has been focusing on this as well. <clears throat> He's been able to demonstrate uh, that um, he can enhance retinal ganglion cell excitability uh, through an axigenic associated mechanism and again uh, using the animal model uh, have shown that, that this is a very uh, promising therapeutic target uh, for not just glaucoma but other age-related neurodegenerative disorders you know like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Let's look more at the different stages and where we could intervene. Uh, here's a model uh, where Larry Benowitz uh, <coughs> used a crush injury uh, to the optic nerve, and he was able to find, actually, that using zinc chelation promoted axon regeneration in the nerve and was able to show improvement uh, in axonal function uh, through this mechanism. But the cell, when the cells are gone, you know, there's not a lot that can be done, and I think we just like there's work that's being done to explore the potential benefit of RPE or photoreceptor transplantation. Uh, we may need to think about retinal ganglion cell transplantation for some of these uh, more advanced stages, and and we've been fortunate to have received uh, two recent uh, audacious goal grants uh, to look at ways that we can uh, address uh, both glaucoma and uh, uh, optic neuropathy uh, to uh, using um, uh, uh, stem cells uh, derived to move into 
regenerating retinal ganglion cells. Moving back to photoreceptors, which is you know, more where us retina guys work, um, we know that photoreceptors are, are critically damaged in macular degeneration. <clears throat> and there are a number of different conditions that lead to this, whether it's retinitis pigmentosa or macular degeneration, or all sorts of retinal degenerations. And um, the model that has been most helpful has been zebrafish. In, a zebra, in zebrafish, we've been able to demonstrate that uh, Mueller cells uh, in the retina can actually become stem cell-like. So when there's an injury, you can, using some external manipulations, uh, stimulate the Mueller cells to become stem cells and actually uh, transform uh, the Mueller glial cells into photoreceptors and have regeneration of damaged photoreceptors. Really remarkable. And, and, and zebrafish have become a great uh, model for studying this. But, you know, we're not zebrafish. <laughs> And our ability to regenerate has not been shown uh, in, in mammals until uh, recently. Uh, Bo Chen at Yale uh, did a remarkable study uh, where he, again, using AAV-based reprogramming, was able to demonstrate that he could uh, generate uh, a, a rod photoreceptor uh, following injury. Um, that it was, you know, a, a multiple stage process uh, where first he stimulated the Mueller glial cell proliferation and then uh, with a, a second uh, treatment <coughs> he was able to get them to uh, transform uh, into uh, photoreceptors. And so you can see in this set of slides, uh, you, you first uh, get the stim increase in the <coughs> Uh, Mueller cells, and then over time, they evolve into a rod phenotype. And so as a result, over time, there was an increase in the number of rod photoreceptors in all four retina quadrants in the mice that were studied. First time that's really been shown in a mammalian model. But more importantly, um, he was able to show improvement in the VEP from this. So not only was restoration of rod photoreceptors uh, in these animals, but there also was improvement in visual function. And this Nature paper that came out this summer, I, I think, gave, gives us extraordinary hope that, that we have direction as to uh, how we can potentially uh, uh, deal with these uh, devastating blinding diseases. Another familiar face to some people here. Uh, you know, Ed is working more along this line. And so the work that we've been uh, pushing Ed to do is to uh, use his knowledge and background uh, in um, developmental retinal biology to uh, get Mueller cells to evolve into a pluripotent state with a regenerative capacity. Um, Ed has been working with zebrafish as well, and uh, we're now having him move from zebrafish into mice uh, with the promise that, uh, that this will be an effective approach to treating uh, retinal degenerations and macular degeneration. You know, what we hear about a lot more often uh, is, is stem cells, RPE transplantation, photoreceptor transplantation, and I haven't really talked about that at all here. And I could show you slides from some of the clinical trials for Stargardt or for dry AMD, small numbers from Steve Schwartz, uh, paper in Lancet uh, with, I think, 10 eyes, was it? Um, where you could demonstrate that, that they stuck under the retina, they survived. But there's nothing really physiologic that these were able to demonstrate in the work. And um, I think that we can say they carry promise, but the challenges of getting, you know, the, I guess I have a lot of problem with the idea that you inject a slurry of cells into the subretinal space and they're going to magically 
uh, integrate with the complex circuitry of the retina. It, it, to me, it just doesn't pass the sniff test. I, can, I, can, I, I mean, I can understand that they will survive, um, but the fact that they're actually going to help people see again, uh, I, I think we're just really far from that. And, and so I, I, I don't want to be dismissive because the last thing any of us know who've done this for a while is, you know, if you have, you know, I don't know how these venture capital guys do it, but that's because they do 20, they invest in 20 things at once, you know, because they know that only one or two of them might hit. And so I'm not saying to be dismissive of it, <clears throat> but I, it, it just, for me, it, I find it very challenging. Um, and there's also the whole issue of, of uh, in the rejection from immunologic response and that these eyes patients will need to, to have a, uh, treatment with, any, you know, with, with, like they have transplants and be on medical system <coughs> medications. And, um, you know, I know they'll do it if it restores their vision. That's not the issue, but, but it's a big deal. And then we've also uh, heard lots about artificial vision uh, retinal prostheses, brain implants, and I know there was a group here uh, that did a lot of work. Are they still active here? So uh, we just had our few first human implantation. Uh, we're we're kind of keeping a little bit quiet, okay. uh, and the results have been very, very interesting, as I'll say. And, and we hope to get the publication out relatively soon. Great. But uh, uh, you know, I, I think it'll be a huge improvement over over trying to take that that grossly aberrated retina after these that, that remodeling that uh, Brian Jones and Robert Mark have pointed out. I think, I think the brain could, could be a better way. It's, it's still long ways from what we would call good functional vision, but I think it's going to be a, a lot, lot better. Yeah, I, I am, you know, the Argus II has been approved, approved. It provides some level of what you could call in quotes regenerative vision. There, there certainly are patients that get the Argus II who are, you know, black blind and who afterwards, you know, can right. uh, function. And, um, you know, it's remarkable. Uh, and, but I, I, again, like you, I worry about the, uh, the ability to take it much farther. And, and the idea of bypassing the damaged retina is, is, is something that has, we need to think about, so. Yeah. And it's, this is also very expensive technology. I mean, I, you know, we have to think about that. Of course, so is the gene therapy. You know, what's it, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for the uh, Luxterna? So, so my reflections on how regenerative visual neuroscience will transform eye care. I I really um, feel that the work should be focused more on better ways to delay degeneration. Um, I I think that the earlier we can treat these patients, the better. That uh, and we don't have effective ways to really do that. Uh, I also feel that our repair should be focused on activating intrinsic mechanisms rather than transplanting. <coughs> I think the focus on, on stem cells and transplanting has gotten a lot of glitz and a lot of co coverage, but I don't think it's as, as physiologically uh, got the same physiologic potential as trying to take advantage of the innate structures and wiring and work with that rather than trying to reinstitute or, or, or re uh, implant new tissue. Gene therapy, I think, needs to be part of it. So many of these conditions uh, do have genetic uh, underlying, and I think that certainly the AAV vectors are great ways to whether it's to change the genetics or whether it's just to put a new repair mechanism in place, right now it's a very valuable way to stimulate transformation of diseased cells into more normal cells. This is our investigators that, that are uh, interested in this at, at our program. Uh, it's become the primary focus for our research. Um, one of the things that, that, that when I became chair, I decided was that we weren't going to be a uh, research program that did everything. That there just was, we weren't going to do cornea research, we weren't going to do lens biochemistry, we weren't going to do amblyopia, <coughs> you know, we were going to focus on basically posterior segment disease. And, and, and it, rather than being, you know, that, you know, 
a mile wide and an inch deep, we, we try to be narrower and, and, uh, and build strength in a few areas. And, and this is where we're focused. And I, I hope that it uh, 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 proves to be effective. Uh, I want to thank Randy for helping support my program with two of his scientists. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and thank you all for the opportunity to come and, and speak here this morning and to visit with your, your scientists and your trainees and your faculty. It's really a, a remarkable place that I, I know you're proud of and, and, and you should be. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity. Yes. So, great summary of the field, uh, Paul, and, and, and uh, we very much agree with the issues that you talked about before. Just a little a historical vignette that a lot of people may not realize. So, David Newsom was a very controversial fellow, as you remember, and, and uh, it was controversial enough that he couldn't get anybody to consider doing this zinc thing that he thought maybe could, could have impact. He, he had tried it on a few patients and he thought maybe it would be important. So uh, he called up Mano Swartz, who was here with me, and Mano came to me and David and said, and I remember David, this is a long shot, I realize, but this really needs to have a prospective randomized clinical trial, and I don't really have any money to do this, and so uh, um, I, I put a little bit of money into the kitty so we could get that study done. Mano agreed <laughs> essentially to you know, do it for nothing, and uh, uh, it was, it, I mean, it was a decent randomized clinical trial of which, frankly, my reaction at Mantles was there's almost zero chance this is going to do anything. And so lo and behold, we were as surprised as everybody else when we showed a, a small but definitely significant yeah, it, it effect. it was statistically significant. There's no question. And, and so the question was, you know, and I said, go for it. you got to publish it. And David said, well, because of me, it's going to be controversial. So we knew when A-RED started, it, it was essentially to answer that question. This is ridiculous. We're going to prove yeah, it. The question, the question was not how can we help AMD. It's how can we disprove. How can we prove that this zinc thing is a joke? focus, right, yeah. We failed. Just, which is the way science should work. Yeah. <laughs> right, actually. You're, you're right. Yes. So, so stem cells are the sort of Alibaba's cave of riches these days that we see all these adverts. I, I, when I was visiting my old hospital, Moorfields, they were doing this subretinal RPE patch under the, uh, under the retinal pigment epithelial layer, which it was fascinating to see. And the theory was purely because, well, these patients are down to counting fingers. There's nothing we can do. There are no more intravitreal injections that work. And you saw that report last year. They came out with two patients. And it was very small. Any, any views about the patch, the stem cell patch? Well, uh, the, the question becomes, if you put in healthy RPE cells, the patient still has macular degeneration. And so you have a of geographic atrophy. You probably have damaged Brooks membrane. You probably have damaged Corio capillaris. Uh, you know, I, I just—it's hard for me. I'd be curious, you know, what what Emmy, Paul, you know, Greg think. I, I, it seems to me a stretch. I mean, I can show you slides that I created for my job <coughs> talk in 1984 when I was being recruited to Emory. Um, of RPE transplantation. I mean, what my talk was, was taking an RPE patch and putting in geographic atrophy. That's what I wanted to do. Now, in those days, there had been no submacular surgery. The instrumentation to do it was, just didn't exist. And, and my efforts to do that in rabbits um, uh, in my first few years uh, uh, were entertaining. I wish I had videos of some of those animal surgeries that I did, because they were pretty ugly. Um, so the idea is not, you know, an original idea. It, it, you, know, you see this patch of GA, and like you want to put something there, you know. You want, you know, we, you know, it's it's just, you know, all of us who see those patients every day. Why can't we just, you know, plug plug the gap? But it, you, the retina is an incredibly sophisticated organ, and the idea of just putting in a, a layer of cells and, and expecting it to repair it, uh, I think, is just too naive. I don't think it'll work. Paul, what do you think? It's, it's been a big challenge, and there, the hype has, has far exceeded the actual reality. You know, we, they, we clinicians have to kind of back that, you know, we have to explain this to patients all the time. Right? That they, they have to be patient, and that science 
doesn't you know it doesn't move as fast sometimes as we would like and we have to do it right yeah it's a hot area though uh, I, I was at a meeting and next door they had it and there are people out there with these clinics that are charging huge amounts of money using their patients own stem cells and they're injecting them everywhere and this one paper I went to, and it was it was it was a foreign medical graduate in, in internal medicine who was claiming that he was doing retrobulbar stem cells and helping people with macular degeneration. And and so I mean it's it's just it's just gotten absolutely crazy. And 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 then a lot of it was the business side. How if you take somebody's fat derived, you avoid the FDA issues because right. you're injecting their own cells. And, and they were getting $25,000 a pop, and they were doing, you know, 20 patients a day with this. It was just mind-boggling. But there were a handful of patients that developed horrible uh, infections. Well, those, in, those intraocular injections. Yes. They also had some trying intraocular. Yes. And so he said, that was a mistake. You do a retro And I, and I, I went up after him. So how do you think that's possibly? How could I don't that possibly know, be Stem cells or some magic potion. It's crazy. But I think if you have AI and stem cells in your company, yes, <laughs> that's right. You're going to throw them. money at you. Yeah. Yeah. So, Paul, great. I, I really enjoyed this. One of the areas that I think uh, we've worked on is re is regarding reactive oxygen species, mm -hmm. and uh, many times, you know, antioxidants are also seen as this magic bullet, but the complexity of their effects as signaling, uh, secondary signaling um, uh, compounds can, can make it really hard to sort of piece it, parse it all together. But I was wondering what your philosophy, philosophy was about that field now, you know, recognizing that we have a lot more information than we did, you know, initially. Well, we did, and as Emmy pointed out in the introduction, that really has, has been my, was my focus of, of research for, what, 25 years. And, and we were able to identify some uh, important mechanisms of, of injury. Uh, and, and I think we were, we were much better at identifying how uh, oxidative stress played a role in the loss, in the damage in AMD than we were at being able to show that repair through antioxidant mechanisms could be effective in treating it. And I think that's where the where you know uh, where the next steps are. I mean, you know, Paul, I know you're. This is where you're trying to take this. I think. What 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 are your thoughts? Um, you know, I think regenerative medicine is. You know, we do need the basic science behind yeah. this. And, you know, I think, yeah, I think it's going to signaling pathways are really going to be more important than just antioxidant yeah. species. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Well.